In lesson one for unit eight, we're going to go look at inverse variation. Today, let's remind ourselves that inverse variation is a relation that's represented by an equation of the following forms, either x, y equals some constant of variation, or y equals the constant divided by the variable x, or x equals that constant of variation divided by some variable y. But we know that the constant can't be zero. Then joint variation is any relation where one variable varies directly with respect to two or more variables. Here in, in the examples below, we see combined variation is a relation where one variable varies with respect to two or more variables. So to begin with, if we say z varies jointly with x and y, we could write that as z equals some constant k times x times y. z varies jointly with x and y, and inversely, that's division, inversely with w. So z varies jointly with x and y and inversely with w. And then finally, z varies directly with x and inversely with the product w times y. So z varies directly with x and inversely with the product of w times y. In example one, we want to look at the table of values in each example and see if the relationship is direct variation, inverse variation, or neither. So to start off with, let's say that y equals k times x, or y divided by x equals that constant. We can use this step here in our table to compare the values. So looking at the first two, if k is 8 divided by 2 tenths and 20 divided by 1 half and 40 divided by 1, all of these ratios are 40. So this is an example of direct variation with k being 40. That's direct variation. And the equation that could model that direct variation comes from these two examples we wrote at the top. So y equals 40x would be my example. In part b, if we say x times y equals k, and look at each of the ratios or the products, we see 40 times 2 tenths and 16 times 1 half are both 8, and all the way through 1 times 8 is 8, and 2 times 4 is 8. So our constant of variation is k, that's inverse variation. And the equation for inverse variation is this sample or this model up here. So x times y equals 8, or if you wanted to write it in y equals form, you could say y equals 8 divided by x. Then moving to our last part, part c, we want to consider is x times y equal to k valid? And if that's not valid, then we want to consider is k equal to y divided by x. So in the first example, 40 times 1 half is 20, and 12 times 1.2 is not 20. It's 14 and 4 tenths. So this model fails. And then considering our other option, y divided by x, 40 divided by a half is 80, and 12 divided by 1.2 is 10. So this test fails, and we see that our table, because both tests fail, is neither direct nor inverse variation since both of our tests fail. 
so we don't have any type of, var of variation here. Example two, suppose that x and y varies inversely and x is two when y is negative three. What function models the inverse variation? Well, our model for inverse is x times y equals k, or like we said, we could solve for y and y equals k over x. So if x is two when y is negative three, then our k value is going to be 2 times negative 3. So our k value is negative 6. And our equation would be x times y equals negative 6, or y equals negative 6 over x. So either one of these are correct. What does the graph of the function look like? Well, if we graph the function, we know that there's a vertical asymptote at zero, x equals zero, and we know there's a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero, and we know when x is two, y is negative three, so we know that, and then we could also think about other points on there. When x is 1, y is negative 6. When the x is 6, y is negative 1. So our graph goes around this way. And then on the quadrant 2, when x is negative 1, y is positive 6. And when x is negative 3, y is positive 2, and when x is negative 6, y is positive 1. And there's our graph. So our branches are in quadrant 2 and quadrant 4. Then to solve our equation x, y equals negative 6, we want to know y when x is negative 5. So negative 5y is negative 6 and y is 6 over 5, which is 1 and 2 tenths. So our point on our graph should be negative 5 and positive 1 and 2 tenths. So when x is negative 5, y is positive 1.2. And that graph, that point lives on our graph right here. Example three says that a recent hurricane left debris around the neighborhoods near your school and the table shows the time in minutes that it takes for a group of N students to remove debris from an average size yard. So our time is in minutes and the number of students is N. We want to know in part A what function models the time needed to clear the debris from an average sized yard relative to the number of students who do the work. So if we said the number of students, which is n times the time, we have 225 students, then time is 225 divided by n, which is relative to the number of students. Or if we wanted to solve for the number of students, we could say that n is 225 divided by the time. So either this equation or this equation or the first equation would all be appropriate. In part b, how many students should there be to clear the debris from an average size yard in at most 25 minutes? So we know that the time in this situation, 25 minutes. Let's go back and use this equation. So the number of students would be 225 divided by 25, and that answer is nine. So the result would be we would need nine students in order to clean the debris from an average size yard in at most 25 minutes. Example four has the number of bags of mulch we need 
to, def to cover a planting area varies jointly. So they're telling us the equation here, varies jointly with the area to be mulched. And they're wanting us to use variable A in square feet. And the depth of the mulch will use variable D in feet. So they've given us the variables. So if we define those variables, just so we know, they told us that B is the number of bags of mulch. A is the area that we need to be mulched, and that's in square feet. And D is the depth of the mulch, and that would just be in feet. And then they gave us, if you need 10 bags to mulch 120 square feet to a depth of 3 inches, we want to convert... Um, three inches is one-fourth of a foot. And how many bags would we need to mulch 200 square feet to a depth of four inches? So four inches, four out of 12, is one-third of a foot. So we need to know those conversions. And then we can write an equation and let's go back and see again. It says the number of bags of mulch varies jointly. So we could say the number of bags of mulch varies jointly with the area to be mulched and the depth to be mulched, and we need that constant of variation. So you need 10 bags to mulch 120 square feet area to a depth of three inches, which is one quarter of a foot. And we need that K value. So four divides 120 30 times. So 10 is 30 K and K is one third. So our equation is gonna be B equals one third a times D. So we're going to use this equation to answer the other question. So how can we solve our problem? We want to mulch 200. So the bags of mulch would be one-third of the area. So the area is 200 and the depth is four inches and four inches is one-third of a foot. So 200 divided by 9 is about 22.2. And we want to round up because we've got two tenths of a bag. So to answer our question, we would need 23 bags of mulch to complete that job. Okay, that's not that bad. Let's put this all together. In example five, we want to find the constant of variation for each variable and then write an equation that can be used to solve the missing value. They've given us if z varies jointly with x and y, when x is 3, y is 5, and z is 120. So 120 divided by 15 gives us our constant of variation, k. So if z equals k, which is 8, x, y, we want to find x if z is 35 and y is 7. So we have 35 is 56x, so x is 35 over 56, and that is about 0.625. In part B, if y varies inversely with the square of x, so let's cut write that down. y varies inversely with the square of x. When x is 3, so y is 7 over 15 when x is 3, and 3 squared is 9. So 9 times 7 
is 63, and 63 divided by 15 is 4 and 2 tenths. And we want to find y when x is 5. So y is 4.2 divided by 25. So y is about 0.168. And then in example 6, our last example, I need to change this on my handout. That should be example 6. Gravitational potential energy is PE, is a measure of energy. PE varies directly with an object's mass, M, and its height, H, in meters above the ground. So we're using the gravitational constant, 9 meters per second per second, in our formula right here. So we're calling that G. G is our constant of variation, and we're using for joules, kilograms times meters per second squared, meters squared over second squared for our joules conversion. In example six, we want to know how much potential energy would a 41 kilogram diver have standing on a 10 meter diving platform. So potential energy, we know his mass is 41 kilograms and the height above the water is 10 meters and our gravitational constant is 9.8 meters per second per second. So potential energy is 9.8 meters per second per second. That's the G. The mass is 41 kilograms and the height is 10 meters. So multiplying that out, we have 4,018 kilogram times meter squared divided by second squared. And this is our joule ratio. So we have 4,018 joules of potential energy for that diver. That, my friends, is the end of lesson one.